Great Scenes from Great Plays, with your host, Walter Hamden, and starring tonight, Brian Ahern in A Tale of Two Cities. Each week at this same hour, the Episcopal families of your own community and the Episcopal Actors Guild invite you to share the dramatic inspiration of great scenes from great plays as transcribed by famous artists of stage, screen, and radio. And now, here is your host, the distinguished actor-manager, Mr. Walter Hammond. Thank you, and good evening. Few famous events have inspired so many great stories as the French Revolution of 1793. Its lofty idealism, caught forever in the words liberty, equality, fraternity, and its terrible cruelty, symbolized by the slaughter of the guillotine, have both illuminated a background of heroism and violence for stories of perpetual meaning. One such it is my privilege to present to you tonight, a play based on the novel by that most beloved of all novelists, Charles Dickens. The story, A Tale of Two Cities. And here to play the unforgettable role of Sidney Carton, it is my pleasure to present the internationally popular star, Mr. Brian Ahern. Thank you, Walter, and I am happy to take part in your presentation of A Tale of Two Cities for it is a story of great strength and great emotional appeal. Yes, Brian, and we are looking forward to your portrayal of the immortal Sidney Carton. So let us raise the curtain now on A Tale of Two Cities. Our Tale of Two Cities, London and Paris, begins in the year 1783. In London's famous criminal court, Old Bailey, a young Frenchman named Charles Darnay is facing a charge of being a spy for France. One of the witnesses is being questioned by Sidney Carton, counsel for the prisoner. And now, Dr. Manet, on the night in question, you say that you were reunited with your daughter, Lucy Manet. Yes. I had not seen her since she was a child. Oh, why? Many years ago... I was imprisoned in the Bastille in my native France without trial. I remained in prison for 21 years. And you cannot identify the prisoner, Charles Darnay, who was your fellow passenger aboard the Channel Packet that night. I had just been released from prison. My mind was not clear. But I am told Mr. Darnay was most helpful to us on that journey. And he has been ever since. I, I, I beg to be excused from testifying against a young man of whom I know nothing but good. Now, tell us, Miss Manette, isn't it true that Mr. Darnay told you he was traveling on business of a delicate nature? Yes, he was using an assumed name. But I have the highest faith in Mr. Darnay. He has been most kind to me. And I hope I may not repay that kindness by doing him harm today. Mr. Bassett, you maintain that for five years you have observed the prisoner, Charles Darnay, making secret journeys between London and Paris. Yes, and holding mysterious meetings with French conspirators, giving them lists of British military interests. Mr. Bassett, look me squarely in the eye, please. Uh, yes, sir. You have testified that on a certain night five years ago, you saw the prisoner, Charles Darnay, secretly exchanging papers with an unidentified man. Now, it has been established that the night in question was a dark, rainy night, and that the man you say was the prisoner was wearing a hat pulled down over his face and a heavy coat. Yes. And yet you're sure that the man you saw was the prisoner? Yes, sir. Did you ever see anybody who resembled the prisoner? Oh, no, not enough so I could have made a mistake. Look at the prisoner, please. Now, I am removing my lawyer's wig. 
Look at me. I said, allowing for the fact that the prisoner Charles Donnie is a fine, upright young man and that I, well, I look a bit older than my years, wouldn't you say that he and I might be twin brothers? I said, are you still so sure of your identification? If the court please, I have shown that this man, a moment ago so positive, is no longer so positive. I further contend that the charges against my client have been pumped up by this paid spy, John Barson. And that an attempt has been made by unscrupulous men serving private ends to send Charles Darnay to his death. Mr. Carton? Ah, oh, Mr. Darnay. You've left our little celebration to celebrate by yourself. Oh, forgive me, Mr. Darnay. But my tastes run to solitary celebration. At least let me interrupt to express my gratitude for your obtaining my acquittal today. Oh, it was an amusing courtroom trick. Still, it saved my life. Mr. Carton, I feel I owe it to you to tell you what I could not say in court. The truth about my business in France. You owe me nothing, Mr. Darnay. Let me judge that. You see, I come of an extremely wealthy and powerful family of France. A family of nobles. There's no crime in nobility, or the lack of it. As my family has wielded its wealth and power, there is a crime. That's why I have renounced my name, my title. The business which took me to France so often was the sale of my portion of the family estates and the settlement of its debts. What is your real name, Donny? My uncle and present head of the family is the Marquis de saint evremont You? A saint Evremond. My uncle considers me a traitor. That's why he used that paid spy, Barsad, to trump up those charges against me. The name of saint Evremond is hated by every man, woman, and child of French blood. Does Dr. Manette know this? And Lucy? I intend to tell them. I see. Uh, will you join me in a drink? No, thank you. Mind if I do? Not at all. It's the weakling's way out of a life of loneliness. But you have no reason to be lonely. I admire you. So does Dr. Manette. And Lucy has a high regard for you. <laughs> regard for me? Love for you. Love? She loves you. And still, knowing that and loving her myself... You love her? Still, I saved your life. <laughs> what a fool I am. And yet I don't mind you knowing it. I've told you part in hate, part in liking... And all in bitterness. Well, perhaps now you can think better of me than I think of myself. You've given me courage, Mr. Carton, to tell Dr. Manette everything I've told you and to ask for Lucy's hand in marriage. You... You've made me a very happy man. Now, that was hardly my intention. Now, I suppose you go back to your celebration and leave me to mine. Hmm? <laughs> Mr. Carton, how pleasant to see you. Oh, you're good to say so, Miss Manette. It's been some time. Do come in. Father's in the garden with Charles. They'll both be pleased to see you. Uh, before we join them, may I express my happiness at the news of your engagement to Mr. Darnay? Charles says it was your sharp eyes that first discovered how I felt. We owe you our happiness. But, Mr. Carton, you look tired, ill. Yes, yes, uh, I am, in a way. Your family, your work. My work? <laughs> There's not enough of it to tire me, and I don't want more. And family? Why, Miss Manette, the only persons I care about on earth are in this house. Then I want you to feel that this house, now and later when Charles and I are married, is always yours. Miss Lucy, will you hear something that I have to tell you? Of course. I, uh, I don't want you to be afraid. Uh, I meant to keep this to myself, but I feel it must be said and done with. I love you. Love. I've loved you from the beginning. Oh, I know it's impossible for you to return the love of a man like myself. I... I love Charles. Oh, I don't deceive myself. Even if Charles Darnay had never been born, I would have no standing before you. But it gives me some slight consolation to know that I'm capable of love for you. It gives me a standard to measure how far I have fallen from what I might have been. It will end in nothing. But I wanted you to know that you inspired it. Mr. Carton, I... I... 
Oh, there's nothing I can say. I know, I know. But there is one thing more I must say. One thing that may, heaven knows how, give my life a meaning in the end. Miss Lucy, for you, and for anyone dear to you, I would do anything. In the happiness that lies ahead for you and Charles Darnay, forget all else I've said, but remember this one thing. That there is a man in the world who would give his life, for what little it's worth, to keep a life you love beside you. Sidney Carton did not attend the wedding of Charles Darnay and Lucy. Yet in the nine years that followed, he remained their close friend. They were nine empty years for Carton and nine full happy ones for Lucy and Darnay. But meanwhile, in France, the suffering among the people had boiled over into bloodshed and revolution. The heads of royalty and aristocrats dropped like rotten apples from the grisly tree of the guillotine, the great knife. The prisons were crammed, not only with the guilty, but with the helpless victims of circumstance as well. In one dank prison cell, an old man is writing a letter. Monsieur Charles Darnay, to you out of the past, out of a cell in the prison of La Force in Paris, comes a cry for help. You will remember me, Henri Gabel, your old friend and business agent in the transactions which sold your estates of the family of saint evremont Now the Republic, for my innocent part in that affair, has imprisoned me. I will die by the guillotine unless you can find some way to help me. I know it is much to ask, but a desperate, helpless old man sends forth this cry for help. Miss Lucy, Dr. Manette, I had your message and came at once. Father and I found this note on coming home this afternoon, Mr. Carton. Charles has left suddenly for Paris. Paris? In heaven's name, why? He's gone to try and save an old friend, Henri Gabel, from the Revolutionary Tribunal. Oh, what foolhardiness. Nobody can be saved. The Republic wants blood. More faces Darnay than failure to save a friend. He may destroy himself. Remember, he's a saint Evremont. But, Father, he renounced his family years ago. Well, that'll be of little consequence, Lucy, at a time like this when blood flows freely. Uh, Mr. Carton, I am an old prisoner of the Bastille. No patriot of France could possibly deny me one small return for my long, unjust imprisonment. Safety for the husband of my daughter. Lucy and I are going to France at once. But that's foolhardy madness, too. The screaming rebels won't hear your plea. Oh, there must be another way. You must stay here. No, we're determined to go. Then you give me no choice. I'll go with you. Next, you there. You were the citizen called Charles Darnay? Yes. Why have I been arrested? Your name is saint Evremont. You're an aristocrat. And they must be executed if they return to France. But I am not an emigre, a fugitive. I left France ten years ago, gave up my family name and my estates. I've returned only to help an innocent old man. See this letter from Henri Gabel. And I'm married to the daughter of a Bastille prisoner for over 20 years, Dr. Manette. Dr. Manette? Was he once a doctor of Paris? Yes, you know him. My name is Ernest Defarge. I was once his servant. When he was released, he was placed in my charge till his daughter came to take him to England. Then you know I could never have married his daughter if I were one of your hated enemies and his. The Tribunal of the Republic will decide your fate, citizen. You will remain in prison until summoned. Next. Here you are, citizen saint Evremont, your cell. You won't be in it long. Jailer. Huh? Let me look at you. I have no time. There are other prisoners. One moment. Yes, in old Bailey Court in London ten years ago. You, John Barsad. Huh? Once a spy for my uncle. Uh, you're mad, citizen. John Barsad. My name is Mutuus Caivola, servant of the French Republic, jailer here at La Force Prison. Your jailer, citizen. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, come in, Miss Lucy, Dr. Manette. 
These rooms belong to the Paris branch of my firm. We may use them as long as we're in Paris. Pray heaven it won't be long. What's that? Why are the people shouting? Oh, a moment, Miss Lucy. Let me close the shutters. Unhappily, these windows overlook the Republic's place of execution. <gasps> Oh, Lucy, put it out of your mind. We have so little time. First, we must find Darnay. Now then, Doctor. This man, Dafar. Yes, my old servant. He will know. He and his wife have a wine shop in Saint Antoine. Surely they can find out for us where Charles is if he's in danger. Doctor Manette, write Dafar your letter for me. I'll go there at once. <laughs> your pardon, citizen. Is there an Ernest Defarge here? I am Ernest Defarge, citizen. Ah, Defarge. My name is Sidney Carton. It's you I've come to see. Can we talk? Uh, at this table. Uh, what is it? I brought you this note from Dr. Manette. He's here? In Paris? Yes. Oh. I, I see he inquires about young de saint Evremont. His name and his sentiments are those of citizen Charles Darnay. Have you any news of him? He... He is held in La Force prison. He is to be tried today as a hated aristocrat. Ah, that's bad news. But Dr. Manette wishes to see you. To ask my help? But how can I help him? It is my wife, above all orders, who hopes to destroy Darnay and all aristocrats. Lafarge, Dr. Manette may be able to touch your wife's heart. Take her with you to see him. Uh, it will do no good, Monsieur Carton, but uh, I will try. Do you come with us? Uh, no, no. Here in your wine shop, I see an old friend. Uh, you go ahead with Madame Defarge. I'll follow shortly. As you say, citizen. Therese. Therese, a word with you. Uh, you there. I, citizen. Yes. You, John Barsad. My name is Skyvola. I'm a jailer at La Fosse Prison. You mistake me, sir. Not that face, but never that hangdog manner, Barsad. Quiet, citizen. Ah, that's better. I'm sure you remember me. Take care, Citizen Carton. I know you, but the game is not equal between us. True indeed. The game is in my hand. <laughs> You'll need good cards for that. Hmm. Cognac, Citizen? Ah, now, let me look over my hand, Citizen Barsad, servant of the Republic, also formerly a spy in the pay of the Marquis de saint Evremond and the British government. Have you uh, followed my hand? But not to understand your play. You may, when I play my ace. Denunciation of Citizen Barsad to the nearest section committee. And then what? The guillotine you wish on others for yourself. What? Now look over your hand. Uh, what do you want of me? You're a jailer at La Force Prison. You will procure me access to the prisoner, Darnay, when I demand it. Take you to him? It would be my head. You forget, Barsad. It's your head already. Now, does the prisoner Charles saint Evremont call Darnay admit his real name? Yes, I've told the tribunal the truth of my life. I have committed no crime. Citizens, why have I been denounced? And by whom? Look there, citizen. I, Ernest Defarge, have denounced the prisoner. And I, Therese Defarge. You, Dr. Manette's old friends. Impossible. There must be someone else. There is. Dr. Manette himself. <laughs> citizen President, I am Dr. Manette. This is a fraud. Who says that I denounce the husband of my own daughter? I demand to be allowed to answer that question. Come to the stand, Madame Defarge. You all know that Citizen Manette spent 21 years in the Bastille. Do you know why? Because as a doctor, he attended a peasant family which has been under the yoke of the scent of Ramon. He saw that family murdered one by one. And for knowledge of the crimes of the St. Evremonds, Dr. Manette was sentenced, untried, to a living death. Of all that peasant family, only I, a younger sister, survived. And the murderer of all my family was the uncle of that man, Darnay, who now stands in the prisoner's dock. <laughs> in the name of my family, in the name of countless others trampled by the St. Evremonds and their power... 
I demand the head of this man. Shall I have it? Wait, wait. My story is true. I have known the real identity of Charles Darnay for years. He never knew it was his family which destroyed my life. I tell you, he is no true Saint Evremont. Then let his life be your sacrifice to the Republic. <laughs> Charles Saint Evremont, called Darnay, you will be taken back to La Force Prison, and thence within three hours to the guillotine. <laughs> Father, Mr. Carton, you must help me. I must die with him. Courage, Lucy. Have courage. I need no courage to die. And I want no courage to live without him. Oh, Lucy, you must. There's still time if we... If I might only see him, embrace him one last time before... Oh, before... Lucy. Mr. Carton, she's fainted. Help me place her no, on no, the no. sofa. Do not revive her now, Dr. Manette. Oh, my poor Lucy. Once I said I would give my life to save a life you loved. It was a sacred promise. I seal that promise now with a kiss you will never know. What the said? There he is, Citizen Carton. But be quick. I shall, I said. Stay where you are. Donny! Carton, you in Paris? And a prisoner, too? No, no. I bring you a request from Lucy that you ask no questions and do exactly as I tell you. First, change that coat of yours for mine. Come on, quickly, quickly. There's no escaping from this place, Carton. What is that strange odor? Odor? I smell nothing. Now, now, your waistcoat, your cravat. You will only die with me. Hurry, hurry, man. No. What odor is that? What is that cloth in your hand? It's nothing. Nothing. No. <laughs> Just something to put you to sleep for a short time. Barsad, he's ready. Take him away. This is devil's work, substituting yourself for a condemned man. It'll cost me my head if it's discovered. Discovered? That trick will not be discovered, Barsad. Why, even at this moment, even you cannot be sure which of us, myself or him, is the man who's going to the guillotine. <laughs> Father, someone at the door, perhaps Mr. Carton with news. Uh, come in. Hey, your help, if you will. Boss. Uh, and Charles. Uh, Charles, oh, uh, oh here, here, arrest him in this chair. He'll recover shortly. Boss, how do you come to be here with Charles Dunnett? There's no time now for questions or answers. You'd best get yourselves and him out of Paris at once. And let me get away from here before I join his friend under the guillotine. Wait, Bassa. Father, here in Charles's coat, a letter. Lucy, my dearest, I will soon climb the steps to the guillotine, not as Sidney Carton, but as Charles Darnay. Strangely... These, These are, are the, the happiest, happiest moments, moments of, of my, my life. life. To, to know, know that, that you love Charles Darnay, and that for these few moments, I am Charles Darnay. I once told you that there is a man in the world who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. The time is here. The world in which I have done so little, in which I have wasted so much, fades fast from before me. But in its stead, I see the lives for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous, and happy, in that England which I shall behold no more. It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. This is 
Walter Hamden, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be back in a moment to tell you about next week's play. But first, an important message of interest to you. One of the great but frequently forgotten principles of the Christian religion is the tremendous power of self-denial and self-sacrifice. Tonight's play was chosen to give inspirational and dramatic emphasis to this principle. The play's hero, Sidney Carton, in giving up his own life on the guillotine in order that those he loved might live in peace and security, finds the great happiness that he had been unable to find in his selfish and wasted life. Yes, we humans are always at our best when we sacrifice self-interest for others. This is as it should be when we remember how our Lord, Jesus Christ, himself suffered and sacrificed on the cross in order that men might see the light of God and be saved. And it's only through this Christian principle of self-sacrifice that we can find solutions to the great problems which trouble the world today. For only by sacrifice of selfish interest can we build satisfactory family life. Only through mutual sacrifice can we build sound community relations. Only by mutual sacrifice can management and labor find answers to their differences. And only by mutual sacrifice can the nations of the world build the enduring peace we all pray for. Obviously, the principle of sacrifice and self-denial must be accepted by each of us as individuals before it can be extended to communities or nations. Today, and for nearly 2,000 years, the greatest teacher of this principle is the church. That's why, if you've not been to church lately, or if you're not a member of a church, we urge you to think carefully now about becoming an active church member. You may find that the Episcopal Church is the one that can give you what you need spiritually. To assist you to know something about the Episcopal Church, what it is, what it stands for, and how it offers you a faith that can bring security and happiness in these difficult times, we have prepared an informative booklet called Finding Your Way. Now, this booklet will be sent to you promptly if you will simply send a postcard or letter with your name and address to the station to which you are listening. I want to thank our cast, and of course you especially, Brian O'Hearn, for a thrilling performance. Next week, friends, it will be our pleasure to present Arthur Wing Pinero's beautiful play, The Enchanted Cottage, the story of a man broken in body and spirit, and a very plain young girl, and how they discovered a great miracle in a strange way in a strange place. Our guest will be the lovely motion picture star, Miss Jean Tierney. I hope you will join us. Now, an invitation from the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church welcomes men and women alike to share in the opportunities for service represented by the Church's wide variety of activities. There is important work to do for those less fortunate than ourselves, work that in the true spirit of the Church makes better people of us all. So after services this Sunday, why not have a talk with your rector about it? He'll be happy and grateful to let you know how you can help.